We are all welcome today to another edition of uh, Cardiology Pharmacist Association of Nigeria, Kapan. And uh, just like I've actually gotten a waiver, I've got a waiver for us to move. Uh, we cannot wait so much longer because time will not be on our, on our sides. There are some people that are already tired after a long day's work. Even myself, I'm still at work. So that we can free them to go and have some rest. Ladies and gentlemen, normally the way we follow our rituals is quite simple. And it follows thoughts. We need an opening prayer. Thank God the participants are gradually increasing. We need an opening prayer to submit our deliberation tonight to the hands of Almighty God. For him to lead us, for us to cross-pollinate and fertilize ideas that will move Kapan much forward so that we'll be able to optimize heart care through cardiology pharmacy in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move. As I call on Dr. Chisomi in the house to lead us in opening prayer. Dr. Chisomi, are you around? Hello? 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 Dr. Chisom, are you there? Hello? Could it be a network or what? Hello? 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 Only call another person, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Eugene, can you lead us in opening prayer? Dr. Eugene, are you there? Yes, I'm around. Please, can you lead us in up? In Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father God, we thank you for another beautiful day. We pray that the presentation this night will open our mind and act as a spark for our specialty. We pray for the presenter, Bierudai Professor Wanang, that at the end of the day, all of us will be beneficiary of this project. And all this will ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, Amen. Thank, thank you so much for that wonderful prayer. Without not wasting much time, we can move. We will continue with our normal rituals. Now, and after the opening prayer, the protocols. Even though he's not around, welcome. Um, whenever I around, he we welcome the number one pharmacist in Nigeria, the father of the profession at this particular period, the president of Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria, Professor Cyril Odiano Sifo. He is unavoidably absent. Whenever he is in the picture, he is highly welcomed. Welcome our wonderful, working, and untiring chairman of CIFAN, Dr. Joseph Madu. Welcome his surrogate. His surrogates, Dr. Motihal Tolulawal. Dr. Mori Mwafo, and all other executives of Sipan that are doing us proud. Welcome the fellows of the profession, the fellows of WAPCP, 
the fellows of Nigeria Academy of Pharmacy, the elders of the profession, the professors, captains of industries, chief executives, H HODs, directors, distinguished colleagues. It is indeed another exciting and stimulating second edition of Kapan clinical meeting tonight. Before we move, before I hand over the microphone to the guest speaker, let me do a little brief on his resume. Professor N. N. Wanang is a pharmacist, a clinical pharmacist, a consultant clinical pharmacist. He is a pharmacologist, a toxicologist. By the virtue of his advancement in biochemistry, he is equally a biochemist. Is a visiting professor and examiner to many universities in Nigeria and beyond. He is a knight of St. Mulumba of Catholic Church. Professor N.N. Wanan is a unionist, a looter conscious, and ever corrosive a looter, because presently he is a secretary to ASU, University of Jazz. He's a director. GS University of Jos was the former Secretary General WAPCP. He is a lead researcher, Plateau State COVID 19 research team. He has over 100 publications to his credit. He is the chairman, faculty of clinical pharmacy, WAPCP. He's happily married with children. He's a fellow of PSN, the fellow of West African Society of Pharmacologists, is a fellow of West African Postgraduate College of Pharmacists, is a fellow of Nigeria Academy of Pharmacists, and all other fellows. If I begin to talk about his resume or his CV tonight, it will take us another long time for us to finish. But ladies and gentlemen, Distinguished colleagues, permit me to formally welcome to the house the erudite professor, the former SG, which in his own tenure, that consultancy pharmacy came into a limelight and many other achievements in pharmacy profession. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor N. N. Wanang to deliver the lecture he knows how to do the best. Prof. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nwafuru. I hope I got your name correctly. Exactly, sir. Okay, I appreciate you greatly for your kind introduction. Uh, permit me to make some slight modification in your statements. Uh, I am not the present secretary of ASU of the university. I was secretary of ASU of the university some times back. I am currently an elder in the ASU uh, kitchen. <laughs> I, I am also not the director of general studies. I was the director of general studies. A tenure I finished about two years ago and I've long handed over to the new director. Thirdly, you introduced me as a guest speaker. This one is English that I find confusing and challenging now because uh, I am not a guest to Sipan. I am You're neither a student. A guest to Kapan, because whichever we I am actively members to both. But probably for the sake of English and protocol, you may choose to use the word uh, guest speaker, which is very okay by me. I sincerely appreciate you. I appreciate you for considering me to give a, a talk this night on the heart. Maureen called me sometimes back and mentioned to me that she would want me to present. And I told her, oh, with all pleasure. And she told me that the topic is the heart. And I was wondering, I said, the heart, just the heart. She said, yes, that they want it to be very basic so that you, everybody should move along before we go into the nitty gritty. Of course, as a professor, I said, well, okay, let me attempt to see. 
I will do my very best within the span of one hour so that I will make complex things simple so that we can move along the line. With your kind permission, if you allow me to block my video so that we can have better clarity, if it is okay by you, I wouldn't mind blocking it. Then I'll go into uh, to sharing my slides. Yeah, free, sir. Thank you. Have you seen my slide? Yes, we can see it, Prof. Oh, very good. That's lovely. Okay, once again, good evening, my dear colleagues. Uh, I appreciate Wafro for the, a, a very beautiful, robust introduction. My name is Professor N.N. Wanang, and I'm so excited about the topic of choice. The topic is understanding the basics, the heart. Candidly speaking, a lot of us know so much about uh, the heart, and unfortunately, the heart is one of the most used words worldwide. You could hear things like, he's heartless, when somebody is mean, or difficult, or a sadist. You could hear things like, from the bottom of my heart. You could hear things like, she broke my heart, or he broke my heart. You could hear things like stories that touch the heart. You could hear when you are very bold and brave, they will say, he has a lion's heart. Well, he has heart, he has heart. Sometimes you could hear my heartfelt sympathy. Or you can hear with all my heart. So confusing. English language has so made the heart to be one of the most used words or organs in the body without really understanding the heart of the matter, if I will say that. And the matter today is the heart, understanding the heart. I will move with the contents to which I discussed with the Kapan. My schedule today, I'm the second presenter. I will narrow my discussion on the walls. I'll talk on the pericardium, I'll talk on the myocardium, I'll talk on the endocardium. I'll talk on the chambers of the heart. Let us look at the left chambers and the right, the upper and the lower. I'll talk about the muscles that separate the two sides, the left and the right, the spectra or the spectrum. And I look at the roles of all the parts we have mentioned above and how they get involved in circulation. However, I've told you there are so many interesting facts about the heart. We use them commonly when we're youths. We use them as lovers, we use them as friends. But so many facts are still uh, interesting to know about the heart. The heart is one organ that works effectively in the body. Every day, our heart beats 100,000 times. That is quite amazing. In 24 hours, your heart beats about 100,000 times. It will interest you also to know that each minute, your heart pumps about 1.5 gallons of blood. You can imagine what it means. Each minute, you add pumps 1.5 gallons of blood. When you look at my slide, you will see a walking, you will see a walking heart by the left. Of course, constantly pumping. If you hold the heart of a human being on your fist, it can, if it is pumping, it can drop on the ground because of the strength of the muscle, muscular contraction. As a matter of fact, even if all if the heart is removed from the human body or from the body of the animal and you place it on the hand, it will, for some minutes, it will still be pumping blood. That is to tell you how loyal the heart is. If the heart beats about 100 times in a day and it pumps about 1.5 gallons of blood every minute, and if this heart should have a problem, then you can imagine it will be a colossal one. And this explains why heart diseases or heart disease is number one cause of death worldwide. A normal heart is the size of a coin, half the size of a coin. That's just the valve that we're talking about now. But a normal heart is the size of your fist. If you are small, the size of your fist is your heart. 
If you are large or huge, the size of your fist is your heart, the size of your heart. The heart, of course, is located in the chest. In between the rib cage, the rib cage provides a shelter for it. And apparently, if it is sliced, you are going to see the lungs to the left and to the right. There is a connection between the lungs and the heart because the lungs serves as the source of gas exchange, collecting carbon, monoxide, carbon dioxide and supplying oxygen, constantly collecting carbon dioxide and supplying oxygen. So the, it receives the deoxygenated blood and then gives it oxygen. So it now becomes oxygenated blood. If it is so, there is a synergy between the two organs. And this explains why if you have a congestive heart failure, one of the first organs to be insulted is the lungs. Especially if there's left ventricular failure, you will see that the lungs will cheaply compromise because blood goes in, it can, it, as it pushes blood so that the blood will come into the heart, the heart cannot pitch it again, it becomes so congested. And the blood that is already in the lungs gets mixed up with the oxygen, with the carbon monoxide, so it gives a frothy environment and that explains why your patients are wheezy, difficulty in breathing, and having chest pains. Let's look at the functions of the heart. Of course, we know the function of the heart when it relates to blood pressure. It routes the blood. So that we routes the blood to the lungs, that is where we have the pulmonary circulation, and it routes the blood again to the entire body system. There we have the systemic circulations. And of course, there are valves just valves in between the heart. There are four different valves which control the movement so that we have a unidirectional movement. You can imagine the confusion if the valves were not there. Just like opening your tap of water, instead of expecting water to flow one direction, the water is full flow in multiple directions. And even if you look at your plumbing system in your houses, you have what is called the no return valve, which is placed by your plumbers so that the water does not return back to the borehole or back to the source. So that it has a unidirectional movement. And that's the same thing that we have now in the heart. There are valves that ensure one-way flow. And of course, it also regulates blood supply to the body. Having said this, the functions of the heart, like I told you before, pumping blood round, oxygenated blood round. And of course, oxygen is a source of nutrients for metabolic system in the body. So when it, it pumps oxygen, rich blood, and the system extracts the oxygen, it now becomes deoxygenated. It now pumps back again to the lungs. No, not online meeting. I'm not online meeting. I'm the one moderating. Mm. It now pumps back to the lungs and the circle goes. When you look at this picture, when you look at the picture before you, anytime you see the blue margin, that means the blood is deoxygenated. If you see the red margin, that means the blood is oxygenated. Having said this, Having said this, you look at lungs again from both sides, left and right lungs. And each time I say left lungs, your mind should go to your right hand. If I say right, your mind should go to your left hand. Just imagine yourself standing before a mirror. When you lift your right hand, it is the left that the mirror lifts. And that is what we're viewing now as we are discussing. Each time I mention left, it is right. I mean, I mean, it is your own right. Each time I mention right, it is your own left. That is how the system is uh, basically described. I made these slides purposely with a lot of pictures, purely pictorial, so that when there are pictures like this, it makes it better for us to understand at this age. Let's look at the anatomy of the heart. I told you, it is caged by the ribs. Like I told you too, the size depends on the age, on the size of the person, and also on the condition of the heart. If there's a large man of the heart, it is an abnormal heart, but the normal heart is what I just going about. And averagely, the size of your fist, if you are large, large fist, large heart, small fist, small heart. The heart is one organ that is very rich in musculature. And why is it rich in muscles? Because if you imagine something that pumps beats 100,000 times and something that pumps 1.5 gallon of blood every minute, definitely there must be some muscles that are pushing them. Imagine pure water container, a pure water bottle, Imagine a hole in a bottle. You need to press it from the lower side so that blood can, I mean, water can ooze out from the hole that you have pierced through. And that is the same thing I want you to imagine how the heart is. So who presses it? Is there any hand that, any fist under your heart at the apex of the heart that presses the heart? The answer is no. 
but there are electrical conductions that stimulate to produce action potential, which results in the contraction, especially of the ventricular muscles, so that when the muscles are contracted, blood is now pushed from the ventricles to the auricles and out, either to the lungs or into the general body circulation. So the musculature is very important. And there are three areas of the musculature that I'm going to uh, concentrate, just to mention for you so that you know what, what it means. At the outer side of the heart, it's like a layer, a double walled surface, which gives it the protection. It is called a pericardium. And if you remember, you can see disease like pericarditis. Pericarditis means inflammation. You can have this like pericardial infusion if there is fluid in the, the cavity. You can hear diseases like cardiac tamponade, which means there's accumulation of fluid within the, within the pericardial sac. This is what I'm saying. If you look at this graph, this pericardial cavity, the blue line you are seeing is the pericardial cavity. If it is inflamed, that's why you have the pericarditis. And if fluid can be accumulated here, it protects the heart generally. And then this is our superior vena cover and the inferior vena cover. Of course, you know that this receives blood, deoxygenated blood. This also receives deoxygenated blood. It depends on where. The upper one receives from the upper region, lower receives from the lower region. This is a picture of what we are saying in summary. The pericardial muscles is the outer layer. And then we have the myocardium, which is the most important because it is a myocardium that produces the contraction that we receive. And then we have the endocardium. The myocardium is the thickest layer in the middle. And it will interest us to know that the ventricular of the ventricle, the ventricular side of the right is thicker than the left because the pumping power is more to the right than to the left. This uh, basically the things I'm talking about. We have the epicardium, we have the myocardium, which is a thick muscular layer, which is involved in the contraction. And then we have the endocardium, which is smooth, the inner lining. Basically, this is how it looks like. Always remember one thing, the epicardium, which is the visceral pericardium, is the outer layer here. If you can see my cursor, it's a thin layer, double walled. And then we have the thick layer, which is the myocardium. Of all we are discussing, this myocardium is the most vital because of its contractor role. This, the pericardium plays the role of protection. And then the myocardium is a muscle that participates in contraction. Are we together? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, here we are. The structures again, the myocardium, the thick middle layer, which you and I have agreed that controls, takes care of contraction. This layer is a layer that we should really, really understand its mechanism. When we get to electrical activity, we'll see that, which I, I think you must have handled that at your last uh, meeting. A summary, the endocardium is the inner layer and it is made up of epithelial uh, tissues. This arrow shows the endocardium, what you are seeing, these are the epithelial tissues. Directly after this, then you have the, the inner components of the heart, which I'm going to discuss that later. Now, the, the, the next thing we should know, having seen the structure of the muscles from the outer to the mid, which is the myocardium, to the endocardium, pericardium, to the myocardium, to the endocardium, and I told you the importance of the endocardium. The next thing we should know now, all these muscles outside, they have rules in contraction, especially the myocardium. And what they do basically is to contract or relax so that we can understand the system of the heart. When we are discussing circulation, we'll now make reference to that. The heart has four chambers, the right atrium and the, left ventric the right ventricle to my own left, to your own left too. Then the left, Atrium and the left ventricle, which is to my own right and which is to your own right. When you look at this picture, the picture we have now, you will see that the right atrium is this one that is circled here, the upper side. And then the right ventricle is this lower side. Looking at these two in comparison, you see that the lower side is thicker, has more muscles than the upper. I've explained to you because it is from here 
that the muscles will contract to pump blood out. It needs more energy to pump blood out than to receive. Then we now have the left ocean, which is to your own right-hand side, which is the upper side. And then we have the left ventricle. The musculature here is not as thick as what you see in the uh, right. However, there are also valves that are involved. The valves I told you are to direct one unidirectional movement of our blood. We have agreed that there are two chambers of the heart. We agree that the atrium receives blood, either deoxygenated or oxygenated. The right receives deoxygenated, while the left receives oxygenated blood. The ventricles are the lower two chambers. And what they do basically is to pump the blood, whether it is deoxygenated or oxygenated. If it is deoxygenated, it is pumping to the left and right lungs. And if it is oxygenated, it is pumping to the other parts of the body so that the body can utilize the oxygen in it. What you should know also, the veins will bring blood into the heart. The arteries will move them to outside uh, from the heart. And of course, I mentioned to you the most important part that you need to know here again is the presence of this muscle here divides the left and the right halves of the heart. These are the valves I mentioned to you. There are four valves, the tricuspid, the semilunar valve, the bicuspid, and then the aortic valve. And here they are, just look at this picture carefully. I'll be showing them to you in points. This here, the separation between the atrium and the ventricle is done by the tricuspid valve, which is shown on this arrow. Next to it is the pulmonary valve, which blocks the uni and which blocks blood from reversing back into the ventricles because the blood will leave the ventricles to the, the left lungs. And then the next one is the bicuspid valve, which is to the left side between the left auricle and the left ventricle. And the last of it is the, another pulmonary, the, the one that takes blood again to the lungs, to the right hand side of the lungs. There's a valve. Most importantly, there are four valves that are involved in the one directional movement. And the purpose is that the blood cannot come back into the heart. If it comes back into the heart, there's going to be uh, a pathology. That means there's a disease. Now let's look briefly on the flow of blood. I mentioned to you the left-hand side, which is my left-hand side, but in reality is the right column. You can see the blue ink, which is deoxygenated blood. Blood will flow from the upper and lower bodies, from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. The upper body brings in blood through the superior. The lower body pushes blood through the inferior. This is what we are talking about. Look at the arrows. You can see the arrow. This arrow is from the superior vena cava coming up from the upper part of the body to the down. And then this second arrow is this one here is coming in from the lower part of the body. And whether it is coming from the upper or the lower, the blood is deoxygenated because the oxygen had already been exhausted by the other cells, other vital other bodily systems. Then the blood is not for oxygenation. So the inf from the right atrium, it will now move to the circle. It will now come to the lower side, which is the ventricle here. However, remember I told you about this valve, the tricuspid valve, which opens so that blood flows. And then the moment the blood has entered into the ventricle, it closes and it is now pushed to the pulmonary artery. Now it will move from the left ventricle into the right, right-hand side. I hope we're all on the same page. Yes, sir. Fine. You can see the arrows. If you can see the arrows, these arrows that I'm pointing, this now moves through here to the pulmonary arteries so that it becomes oxygenated. The long and short of what I'm saying is the blood will eventually get 
uh, oxygen from the lungs. So let's look at this. This is a summary of the blood flow of the circle. The pulmonary arteries interchange between the heart, the lungs, oxygen is transferred into the blood. The blood now becomes oxygenated and it is now pushed to the left-hand side so that the left-hand side will now push it out for circulation to the remaining parts of the body. At any point, if you are not getting me, please look at the circle. The circles I'm showing are also showing in your sight. You really need to be looking at these pictures very well. This is what, what I'm talking about. This is our left lungs. This is the right lungs. Blood deoxygenated to the left of your to your left, oxygenated to your right. But of course, your right is the left, and your uh, left is the right in terms of description. This is the flow I'm talking about. The smallest blood vessels, the capillaries are interconnecting within the lungs and then they do the gas exchange. Having said all this, the left and right veins will bring the blood back to the heart because I mentioned to you from the circulation, from it being oxygen rich, it will turn down to the body, haven't been used, then back again is a continuous chain. This is the left pulmonary. Look at it from your uh, table. You can see the right pulmonary vein which brings blood from the left lung, uh, right lungs. And then we also have the left pulmonary veins, which brings blood from the right lung. Bringing blood from right lung now means the blood has already gotten oxygen. You can see the arrows pointing to the red side, meaning there is already oxygen in it. Then the pulmonary veins will now empty the blood to the left atrium. The left atrium is already oxygenated. Remember, from the left atrium, it will now shift down to the right, ventricle through our valves and then the circle continues round and round. This is a summary of what happens in our system. Now let us just pause for two minutes and then watch this film, which will give us a summary. <laughs> Okay, this video is actually a summary of all I've been discussing in the last 20 minutes. And it is so clear, very simple and straightforward. Now let's quickly see the circulation. I've told you there are two circulations of the pulmonary circuit and the systemic. Pulmonary deals two exchanges between the lungs and the heart. Remember I told you, blood from the heart to the lungs, from the lungs to the heart. It's a two-way traffic. The one that goes to the lungs 
is not oxygen rich. The one that comes from the lungs must be oxygen rich because respiration brings in oxygen and pushes that carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. So if it is so, the lungs are very rich in oxygen. So that explains why they constantly supply oxygen to the blood. It is called pulmonary circulation. This is what I'm saying, moving between two. Systemic now means the circulation between the heart and the remaining parts of the body. Both ways, the oxygenated, oxygenated. If it is from the left-hand side, it has oxygen. It is from the left-hand side, I mean, from the right-hand side, it is deoxygenated. You can see it in color. That's basically what we are seeing here. Now, like I said earlier, the left side of the heart is larger than the right side of the heart. Why? Because of the pumping of the muscles to systemic circulation to many parts of the body. This is a summary of what I've been talking about, systemic pulmonary circulation. And you can see the lines. You can, most of these things look repetitive, but they are very important so that you can understand the basics of how the heart works. Now let's quickly see another phenomenon that is of interest to us, which is related. If you look at it, most of these things are interrelated. Events come number one, number two, number three. Then let us see what is now a cardiac circuit. The heart contracts, the heart relaxes. And this gives you the heart sound, the lip dip sound that you hear in the heart. You are hearing the contraction from the atrium, passage of blood, dropping of blood in the atrium, blood through the valves opening, dropping it again into the uh, right ventricle. Then the first and second sound heart are heart. Now, the systolic is a contraction. We have the atrial systole when the atrium contracts and pump blood into the ventricles. And then we have the ventricular a contraction when the ventricles contract and pump blood out of the heart to the lungs. Of course, diastolic is basically relaxation. There are some terminologies we keep on hearing each time we come to uh, heart conditions as cardiologists. We hear things like cardiac output. We hear things like cardiac reserve. Cardiac output, of course, is implicated in hypertension. And cardiac output here now means the quantity of blood that is pumped out per minute. Like I said, the ventricles will contract and then the blood will pump out. If it is that, cardiac output and heart rate are related. Cardiac output and total peripheral resistance are related in blood pressure. Now what, again, if we say so, if cardiac output represents CO, then cardiac output is proportional to the heart rate, meaning the more the heart beats, the more blood will be pumped out of the heart. And then the more the stroke volume, the more it is related to the quantity of output that we are going to have from the heart. What is now stroke volume? You see stroke volume, the atrium will relax, blood will come in, the atrium will contract, blood will flow down. The ventricles will relax, blood will come in, the ventricles will contract, blood will flow out. So the period to which blood is pumped into the ventricles, and then when it contracts and pumps out, Definitely, it cannot empty the entire blood. The quantity of blood that comes in, assuming it is, let's say, one liter or 1.5 liters. When it is pumped, you don't expect the whole liters to pump out, no. A fraction will be pumped out. So the stroke volume is the amount of blood that is pumped out by the ventricle with each beat. As it, it comes in and pumps out, you calculate it, it now gives you the relationship between heart rate and stroke volume, which means they are both related, they are proportional to the quantity of blood that will flow out. Then the difference between the resting and cardiac, maximum cardiac output is the cardiac reserve. Like I told you, when blood pumps in, into the heart, we don't expect the whole blood to be pumped out again. There must be some reserve. There must be some reserve. The, all the quantity that is pumped out, definitely there must be some inside the heart. So the difference between the two is now called the cardiac reserve. I'm giving this narration of this terminology because you are going to see them coming out in hypertension. You see them coming out in congestive heart failure. You see them coming out even in cardiac arrhythmias. Now, we have agreed that the heart also regulates stroke volume. And like we see, stroke volume is a quantity of blood that is pumped per minute by the ventricles. If it is so, then the stroke volume will be end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. Remember, relaxation and contraction. Contraction does the pushing out. Relaxation does the coming in. So when it is relaxed and blood flows in, and when it is contracted and blood flows out, 
the difference between the two is now our stroke volume. That means the quantity of blood pushed out per minute at one pump, at one beat. So the amount of blood collected in the ventricle during diastolic is now the end diastolic volume. And then the amount of blood remaining in the ventricle after contraction is now our end systolic volume. So the difference between the diastolic volume and the systolic volume will now serve as our stroke, our stroke volume. As we move on, there are terminologies that I know in the university you've been hearing and they could be very uh, difficult to preload, afterload. Preload, like the name implies before. Afterload means after. So preload, we are all talking about the heart. We are looking at the heart as is either overused, overstressed, or the heart is over troubled. So when the blood, when the blood flows in from the atrium to the ventricles, the ventricles are most times stretched by the volume, by the quantity of blood that comes in. So the muscles are stretched. That is the effect of preload. Then when they are contracting again to push out, there are, there's pressure that is being exerted, leaving the heart with a lot of pressure. That is what happens in afterload. And the contractility, of course, you know, they must contract. The force of contraction is, con uh, is important. The conduction velocity is important. As we move along, you must have had things like chronotropy, ionotropy. The chronotropic is talking basically about the heart rate. And then the ionotropy is talking basically about the contractility of the heart. This is the picture of what I've been explaining. When you look at this side, as oxygenated, deoxygenated blood drops in here. As oxygenated blood drops in here, there's a stretch by the muscle walls at the ventricles. And this is what we have as preload. Now, as the blood is living out now, living out from here to the tricuspid valve, to the bicuspid, bicuspid valve out here, the stretch, the pressure that is exerted by this muscular contraction is now our afterload. This, you are going to see this uh, showing out again when you are discussing hypertension, the pathophysiology of hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias, congestive heart failure, ETC, ETC. Now let's quickly look at what happens, what are the electrical conduction in the heart? There are three basic steps that we should know. We have the SA node, that's the pacemaker cells. We have the AV node, and then we have the bundle of fees, which separates from the septum. And then the hypokinase is found in both the left and the right side. And it goes in the same format. Electrical impulse will come from the atrium. There are the SA nodes. The SA node is the sign of atrial, separating at the atrium, passing it to the AV, the atrium and the ventricular, and then passing it to the bundle of fees and then to the Purkinje fibers. The, this is the summary of what we have. The signal is in sequence. The first thing, electrical signals will start from the SA node as blood comes in. And this will cause a contraction of the atrium. And then the SA node picks up, passes it to the AV node. As blood moves into the ventricles, then it now separates the bundle of fees to the ventricles and then to the Purkinje fibers and there is going to be passage of information and action potential to a complete cycle of contraction is done. This is, in summary, the picture of what I'm saying. Number one, this is where we have the SA node. The pacemaker cells as impulse are generated, it bounces here, then comes to the AV node, then comes to the, here, which is the bundle of fees, and then separates to the Purkinje fibers on the both left and right. Let's also take some minutes and watch this thing. Thank you. 
Yes, that's uh, the summary of what we've been talking about. Okay, that's summary of what we've been talking about. Had. Now, if you look at all we've been discussing, there seems to be nothing new. There's nothing new about it. We know they had long ago, just the little intricacies of how it works so that when we get to the disease conditions, it can now give us a picture of what is happening. Let's pick some few diseases and see. Hypertension. You can see from the description of how they had the blood flows, the muscles of the heart, the functions of the valves, and then the associated organs around them. And we have now said heart uh, hypertension is directly related to heart disease. Why? Heart rate has increased, conduct, uh, pumping of blood has also increased. And of course, if it is hypertension, we also have the activity of the blood vessels, which of course we know are by constricted. Then what is congestive heart failure? The blood drops into the heart, but the heart does not have enough energy to pump the blood out. So the heart becomes weak, blood gets into it, gets filled, the heart gets enlarged, and then it fills. Then myocardial infarction, the commonly called heart attack, what happens to it? There's also a blockade of coronary artery and then there is no supply of oxygen to the heart. And then the heart muscles will die because the oxygen is needed for normal activity, normal functioning. If the, the, the ventricular muscles that we've been saying do, are not oxygenated, they, 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 they become weak and they die. And if it is so, the heart then becomes enlarged and then we have heart attack. Then what is arterial fibrillation? There's an abnormal impulse generation from the atrium. Remember the functions of the SA node, the AV node, and if the electrical discharge in these two are not coordinated, there's, going, there's bound to be an abnormal electrical impulse generation so that we are going to have an increase in electrical activity or premature contractility or action potential generation. We also have ventricular fibrillation. This is also an abnormal impulses, which is particular to ventricles. And of course, it's going to produce irregular heartbeat and it's going to have a lot of other organs associated to the heart will also feel, especially the lungs, like I mentioned at the beginning. And then cardiac arrhythmias, an abnormal rhythm of the heart leading to multiple beats. And we have also angina pectoris. These are all heart conditions or diseases as well with all these heart functions and activities that I have said in the past. Here in angina pectoris, there's deficiency of oxygen again. Oxygen kept on coming up over and over again once we are discussing the heart. There is coronary blood blockage, chest pain, yes, ischemia, because oxygen is not there. So there's a shift in metabolic function from anaerobic to aerobic condition. Having said all this, like I said at the beginning, there's nothing new about the heart that you are hearing. It's just a reminder of the knowledge that we have on the heart. If it is so, I think I will stop here to allow opportunities for questions 
and uh, responses. However, this slide definitely will be forwarded to you, everybody on the platform, so that you can have it and play. Of interest, when you look at the two video clips, very, very simplified, and it gives you the summary of the entire activity of what happens. I sincerely want to appreciate uh, Kapan once again for finding me worthy to interact with my voice amongst all of you. Most importantly, to have stayed this late, I had to call Maureen this morning. Are you sure it's 9 p.m. or 9 a.m.? I was wondering. You must really be determined persons. I'm surprised that I have up to about 57 participants waiting on board for this lecture. Thank you so much. I appreciate you greatly. I will leave it open for questions or any other comments as directed by the moderator and coordinator. Dr. Wajiru, thank you so much and over to you. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, with this lecture tonight, our heart will begin to pump much better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. It's, it's a wonderful one. Uh, if actually refresh our brain, what we learned in anatomy and pathology in these universities. That is a wonderful one. <laughs> I, I must commend you. This is a, you did a surgery to this case in every part. And uh, I don't think any person that attended to this tonight lecture will have many things, will have anything to lose because it's a thorough dissect and uh, it's a thorough conceptualization. Thank you so much, sir. I, Thank you so much. Before I will continue from welcoming questions, appraisers, contributions, I have to leave the microphone to the father of Sipan whom in his ingenuity, Sipan has actually metamorphosed into a lot of variants that are making the profession of pharmacy proud in the world today, even in beyond the shores of Africa. So let's, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, distinguish colleagues, others of the profession, fellows, let's quickly welcome our national chairman, Dr. Joseph Mado, for him to make his contributions, appraisers, questions, in his normal, usual way. Dr. Madu, sir, you're welcome on board, sir. Please, can you? Hello, Mr. Moderator. Am I audible enough? Yes, gradually you are getting more audible. We are getting more audible. Okay, okay I'm very sorry. I'm not in my usual, or I'm not at my usual. Uh, place of residence. I'm outside the um, Port Harcourt and where I am, the network is bad. Uh, don't worry, after, the, don't after this, your heart will pump better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Let thank me you sir. this opportunity, yes, to appreciate uh, Professor Wanan. While he was delivering his lecture, I was wondering what Sipan would have been without people like him. And uh, he has continued to be with us, as is commonly said, come sun, come rain. Professor Wanang has been with us even at the beginning of the SIPAN initiative. Prof, I must say thank you very much. SIPAN will remain ever grateful. We will never forget. And then to our young association, Kapan, I want to appreciate the desk officers Sorry, I hope I'm still audible. Yes, sir, you are. Yes, let me appreciate the desk officers. I know it's not an easy task at all. Dr. Maureen and Dr. Nuruddin Usman. It's not easy. They are actually setting the pace. The cardiology pharmacist group has actually been setting the pace for others to follow. And I'm proud to say that I'm... Um, I'm also a cardiology pharmacy specialist. So let me use this opportunity to once again appreciate the desk officers and then the participants. As I always said, without participants, then there will be no lecture. So sorry, pardon me, I'm not, as I earlier said, at a very good network area, but I want to appreciate all of you, the member of Dr. Bello and every, every person whether I mention your name or not, you are very important and very close to our hearts. I can also only say, let us keep on keeping on. And the good Lord, in his infinite mercy, will always be to guide and direct us as we better human health. 
through pro, uh, pharmacy profession. God bless us all. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to Kappa members. God bless you. God bless thank you too. Thank you so much, my hey. chairman. Thank you so much, our, our able chairman. At least your peacemaker activity will work much better this night. After this, uh... <laughs> uh, there are some people raising their hands. Uh, one uh, on top of the list is uh, Ibrahim Muhammad. Ibrahim Muhammad. Ibrahim Muhammad, are you are you there? Your hand is up. Are you there? If he's not yeah. there, Doctor Morin Waf, are you there? Hello. 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 You're not audible. There is arrhythmia. There is arrhythmia in your voice. It's not audible. It's not smooth. Hello. Yes, there is arrhythmia. So remove the arrhythmia so that it can, blood can pump very well. Hello? 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 Dr. Maureen Waf, are you there? Hello. This is Ibrahim Muhammad speaking, sir. Am I audible? Okay. Uh, yes, you are better now. So... The, the blood is pumping well now. So go ahead, go ahead, sir. Okay, I just want to uh, appreciate Prof for the professorial uh, lecture. And uh, I just want to wish him well and may he live long so that we continue to benefit from his knowledge and wisdom. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much too. I appreciate you greatly. Over to you, our vice chairman, Dr. Maureen Wafo. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, Sam Audible. You are, Hello. You are, you are, you are. Go ahead. Man. Okay, I want to, I want to sincerely appreciate our honorable professor. Oh, I'm so happy. I, I, I really hooked on around 8 p.m. I, behold, I was the only person. I, said, ah, I went by Saturday <laughs> nine, I, and I'm, I'm back. I was really waiting for this basis. So interesting. It, you know, I was enjoying the lecture until I saw the thing. I said, ah, what? I was still expecting more slides. <laughs> so, bro, you did a wonderful work. <laughs> it was really basic. You know, even a, a layman can easily understand how the heart functions. So thank you very much, Prof. And I just want to plead you, with you. We are really expecting part two. Because you just <laughs> cut it off when you were just, you know. So please, do come back. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I don't have a problem coming back. Understand. I, I was okay, working bro. with the instruction. <laughs> the instruction yeah, before exactly. me, when we spoke with Maureen Otters, she told me yeah. I should speak for 50 minutes. <laughs> And then I was also given the uh, areas that I should focus on. But honestly, we may not be able to learn everything in one day. I like the exactly. way the Kapan is going about it. Sure. We do it in bits and pieces so mm -hmm. that we don't rush it and get confused about it. Beautiful start, beautiful beginning. Exactly. Yes. And then exactly. as we go this... on, we understand the heart in and out. So it won't be a problem for us exactly. again. Exactly. So I still encourage our dear young association to still continue with this basis. Because once we jump into the main disease states of the heart without understanding the basis, some people may just be thrown out of the tray. So thank you very much for today. And I hope to get more of this in future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Maureen Wafa. I said you just moved the motion and I seconded it. Just like in the parlance of unionism. Say, I, the prof will come for part two, part three, and part four. I say, I second it. And so shall it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've seen the two people have actually spoken in appraisal forms. I don't know whether there are other people in the house that have some questions to ask or have um, contributions to make or even uh, quite 
advance more in our presence. If you are, just unmute yourself and follow suit. And quickly do it so that you will not have a um, resident of uh, blue blood in your system, which is the deoxygenated blood. Hello, hello, house. Uh, hello, house. Hello, we can hear you. Uh, we can hear you, on, sir. Uh, uh, based on, uh, I don't know, based on uh, what I'm seeing, you know, you. There, there is one adage that says, when a food is cooked very well, the people in the house will not have any reason to complain or ask questions, why is it like this? Because the rightful ingredients are contained in the rightfully cooked food. So what they will be saying is that, I need more portion of the food. Why did you not do it politically that you don't give me much? So at this particular point, and at this particular juncture, people are no longer interested in asking questions. They are so happy because the lecture was quiet, from the cradle, from the basics, and they have conceptualized it within their mindset, and their superconscious mind is beating positively in locked up position for them to get it much where the heart pumps. That's the way the knowledge is pumping. So why they might not be in condition to ask questions or appraise more to prove is that they are so happy, they want to retire to bed and begin to ruminate about the level of knowledge which our erudite professor has actually pumped into this network today. So, Prof, I must say that we are highly grateful. And uh, we will continue to thank you for what you are doing to pharmacy profession in Nigeria. And uh, specifically now to the level of Kapan. God will keep on enriching you in your word of Amen. knowledge and keep Amen. on blessing you to keep making us proud. We were happy that you are one of us and we'll keep enjoying you and God will keep on keeping you alive. Thank you See, so much. Even the younger generation will keep coming up to utilize more from you. God bless you, sir. God bless you too. Thank you so much. At this particular juncture, I have to call on um, the man who holds the instrument of um, computation, digitalization, manipulation, all sort of them. Dr. Ibrahim Bello, for him to lead us in closing prayer and equally do a vote of thanks. Dr. Ibrahim Bello, I know you are in the house, sir. And God, the Almighty Allah, will not in any way rest in his arms in blessing you, supporting you, guiding your family. For the time, he all, at times I begin to wonder. I don't know the particular energy you have. In everything we appear to you, you always stand there to do it for us. The Almighty Allah will keep blessing you, sir. Thank you and welcome on board to do a little vote of thanks and close this wonderful night prayer for us. Okay, thank you, Dr. Soma. I want to start by thanking our guest speaker, our own Professor Hoanak for that very educative and inspiring lecture. We cannot thank you enough, sir. Thank you so much and God bless you. Uh, moreover, I want to thank all the participants for coming again tonight to add to our knowledge. You are all appreciated. I will give thanks to God Almighty who give us another opportunity again to be together again to add to our knowledge. In his name we trust and we pray. Amen. End of prayer. Amen. Uh, good night, Prof. Amen. Good night. Thank Amen. you so Amen. much. I appreciate you. Good night, Prof. Thank good you. Good night. Thank you. Everyone. Bless you. Thank you. All. Really appreciate. I appreciate it. Really appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.